So for folks joining in, thank you so much for being here. If you have um, questions throughout the talk, please put them in the chat and we will um, address them to Angie afterwards. Um, but she may answer some questions during the talk. Um, I would love for folks who are in attendance to let us know where you're tuning in from. I see someone now, good timing, coming from Hawaii. And um, so not just where you're coming from, but if you are aware of the original people on whose land you reside, please share that with us as well. I lived in Hawaii for 10 years. <laughs> wow. Oh, I see I Tiffany is, yep, Tiffany's question yeah. from Hawaii. What island did you live on, Angela? I lived on Oahu. Oh, my. I started out living in Waikiki and then I moved um, to just above Pearl Harbor in a place called Aiea. And I, I stayed there for a little over okay. a decade. Wow, nice. Um, my friends lived on Oahu for a while and I did visit them. Uh, for about 10 days or so. It was, it was incredible. That's a good folks here from Canada, LA, Massachusetts. Oh, wow. I'm seeing. It's exciting. Um, so we do, um, we do have this recording at the moment and Angie, you're okay with that, right? And we can post that to our um, YouTube pages after. Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. So for those of you asking, we will be recording this session and we will plan to um, post this. It will go to the Erie Canal Museum's YouTube page um, and the Indigenous Values Initiative YouTube page as well. So we will update you about that stuff um, after the talk. I'm just gonna put our website in here. Okay, Derek, thank you. I got your um, message about the recording. I appreciate it. Okay. I'm just gonna wait another one or two minutes. Okay, so the name of that publication, give me one minute and I will show you the Sarah is helpfully tuning in from the Scano uh, kit shop, so. Yes, <laughs> thank you. I've been tuning into a lot of these from home, but tonight I'm in the gift shop. So um, the publication I mentioned is called Neighbor to Neighbor, Nation to Nation, and it's a, uh, like a reader. Um, we sell it for under $10 and you can get it on our website, but the Syracuse Peace Council offers a PDF of this document. So you can check that out there. So the organization is the Neighbors of Onondaga Nation and they are a part of the Syracuse Peace Council. I will try, as Angie begins talking, I will try to add some of those links to the chat and we'll go from there. I know an hour and a half is quite a long time to talk. So if people may need a break to use the restroom or something like that, just let me know. All right. I well, think that would be all right. Sure. Yeah, and don't, um, don't feel like you have to go an hour and a half, Angie, if you're somewhere between 45 okay. minutes or an hour, I think that would be plenty of time. Um, does everyone feel ready to get started? We're doing pretty well here. We've got over 40 participants. Wow, we're getting people from all over. This is great. Okay. All right, well, I'm gonna get started. It's 7.05 and I just wanna thank everyone sincerely for joining us on this very beautiful summer-like evening. And Angie has had a full day with some events on the Onondaga Nation. And so we're so thankful for her to join us. Uh, my name is Sarah Shu. I am the director of the Scano Great Law of Peace Center. For those of you who are not familiar with our center, we are a cultural heritage center that is centered around Haudenosaunee history, culture, values, and contributions. 
We are located on ancestral and uh, Onondaga land on the shores of Onondaga Lake, which is sacred to the Haudenosaunee. It's where the peacemaker came over a thousand years ago to unite the original five nations under the great law of peace. The Confederacy and the great law of peace were inc incredibly inspirational to the formation of US democracy, to the American women's rights movement and to environmental advocacy work all over the world. I want to take a moment to have my co-host Derek Pratt introduce himself and talk a little bit about the partnership that we've engaged in this year to highlight indigenous foodways. Yes, thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm Derek Pratt. I'm the educator and interim curator at the Erie Canal Museum. Um, also uh, on um, Onondaga land right in downtown Syracuse um, in the uh, only remaining Waylock building of the seven that existed on the Erie Canal. Um, this year, uh, the Erie Canal Museum has started its uh, Erie Eats project uh, funded by um, the Erie Canalway National Heritage Corridor and William G. Pomeroy Foundation, um, where we're looking at the history of food uh, along the banks of the Erie Canal. And through this project, um, which is really how uh, Sarah and I started working together, um, we're, we're trying to really expand the uh, narrative of the canal. Um, tradi traditionally, there has been one, it's been the European uh, settlers focused uh, with the Erie Canal. And we really wanted to talk a lot more about the, the foodways of the Haudenosaunee who lived here long before the Erie Canal came through and, and continue uh, to live uh, on its banks uh, today and have a thriving and uh, really interesting food culture. Um, so that's kind of was the impetus for um, the series of, of talks we've been putting together this year. Um, so I wanna thank you guys for having us. Thank you, uh, Angie, for coming out tonight and, and talking with us for this as well. I'll just um, mention briefly before we get started, um, we've had some generous support from the American Indian Law Alliance, the Indigenous Values Initiative, the Erie Canal National, uh, the Erie Canal Way National Heritage Corridor, and the William G. Pomeroy Foundation. So I just want to thank our sponsors. Um, I would also mention that donations to our organizations are certainly welcome and appreciated, and those can be made through our websites, which I'll share in the chat as we get rolling. So I would now, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our featured guest speaker for the evening, Angela Ferguson. Angela is a member of the Onondaga Nation Eel Clan. She has been the Onondaga Nation Farm Crew Supervisor since 2015. The farm is responsible for all aspects of food sovereignty within their community, including planting, harvesting, seed preservation, foraging, medicine gathering, traditional food preparation, butchering wild game, beekeeping, food distribution, and community and elder meal preparation. Angela is also one of the organizers of Braiding the Sacred, an organization that has gathered hundreds of indigenous corn growers together to share knowledge from respected elders about seed sharing and planting methods. Angie, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us tonight, especially at what I know is an incredibly busy time of year for you. So thank you so much. We're so happy to have you join us. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, to all who are here to listen. Um, my name is Angela Ferguson, and you've heard my introduction. I'm very proud to say I am Onondaga Eel Clan, and I'm also very proud to say that uh, people are interested in food again. So in order for me to be able to talk about the things I'm very passionate about, you have to have people who are interested to listen. So uh, I thank all the people who are um, on board with this call today. Um, I like to kind of start my presentations as more of a storytelling 
I find that it has more of a connection. So um, I'll let you guys know from my aspect of what my definition is of indigenous food sovereignty and kind of um, what I can see people would be able to benefit from by being on this call, then maybe you can take away a little bit of some of the things that I've learned. Um, a lot of the things I'm gonna share are not just my own knowledge, but it came from elders before me. And I'm very thankful that um, they carried that knowledge and shared it with me and that I'll, I'm gonna be able to pass it along to others. So um, knowledge has a genealogy as well. And I think it's always really important um, to share who you learn things from. And, and it makes me actually think of those people again. So um, one of the things I wanted to start about talking is um, what brought me into this circle of what I call life and food sovereignty. And one of the, um, you know, growing up, one of the main things for me growing up, I grew up in the Tuscarora Nation, a community in Western New York. And we have an Onondaga family there. We have uh, 232 of us still to this day. And me and my grandchildren uh, moved I moved back here first and now my grandchildren are the uh, 10th generation of Onondaga people that have finally um, been born back here in our initial homeland. So I'm really excited about that, that we have these wonderful communities that we can always return to. And when I grew up in the community of Tuscarora, I grew up surrounded by uh, agriculture and there was a lot of farmers at that time and so it was something we experienced throughout all of our childhoods gardens were always a big part of Haudenosaunee life and you know in this technological age as things became easier and and more accessible there were fewer and fewer people farming so um I wanted to see that come back for our next generation like I grew up being able to see and I've traveled a lot I love to travel and I love to uh, meet people from different communities. And I think that's actually a really important part of um, agriculture is communicating with other farmers and all of us sharing the knowledge where we can talk about the struggles and also talk about the successes. Also to share seeds and recreate uh, our old economy of using food as our currency and our connecting um, endeavor between nations. So the farm here in Onondaga Nation, um, is something that's very personal to me, very um, dear to me. I really feel connected to the land there and all of the workers do. So the whole point of the actual project itself is to create a communal environment where we're all working together to feed our nation like we used to do in our villages. And it's been quite a success and it's been so, um, it just grows every year and it becomes, you know, more things get added in and, and more seeds come back to us. And it's just, it just fills up. It's so, so full of life. I wish more people could experience that, you know, um, we actually travel to different nations and we help other places who may be struggling with, um, you know, getting agriculture resuscitated in their communities. And so we, offer our hands, our help, our hearts, our seeds, anything that we need to make it possible and to help other places get these projects up and running. So the goal of the farm really is to follow what our, our, our ancestors definition was of food sovereignty. And that is being able to grow your own traditional foods on your traditional homelands with your community, your fellow community members allowing those seeds and those foods to be, be part of your ceremonies and have all of those things connected together and sharing all of that with the community so that we are self-sustaining. In addition to that, we always have to think ahead too to be prepared to put food away. And so when this pandemic hit, you know, we were prepared as a nation, Onondaga nation. And that was very comforting to a lot of people who were feeling anxiety, stress, worry about how, what if all the grocery stores shut down? What if there's no more food? Um, what if there's no distribution, you know, methods to get food into the, you know, this area into our grocery stores. And people did actually call me and say, do we have food put away for us? And yes, we do. And I'd like to see every community um, 
you know, get back to that and kind of prioritize thinking of all the little ones and elders that we can't just think of ourselves. We have to think of our communities as a whole. And so people found comfort and took comfort in that fact that we didn't have to panic. And that is part of the sovereignty right there. So when we started up the farm, it just started out as um, one little garden. And I felt like we haven't grown our foods here in a long time. So the first thing we have to do is call the leader of our plants and the leader of our plants is the strawberries. And so we went down uh, into the village on the nation and we dug up little strawberry plants and we put them in five gallon pails and we didn't have um, you know, any farming equipment to break the ground or anything. So we just um, did it ourselves. <laughs> we just used hoes and rakes and we just kind of scratched the top of the earth and we transplanted those strawberries up to the farm. And they took off like nobody's business. We had so many strawberries, we didn't know what to do with them. And we froze them and we saved them for um, our ceremony times. And we gave a lot to the clan mothers and it just, it was almost like they were so pleased to be back on our ancestral land. And so that was the beginning. And once we brought the leader of the plants, the rest of them followed. So the following year we had a cornfield and then we planted beans and squash and had all our three sisters there. And it's just sort of taken off from there. So, you know, a lot of the work that we do by hand isn't to make manual labor or make it difficult but it's to know that we can still keep um, our traditional form of agriculture alive and keep that knowledge that we're able to pass down to the younger people. And I'm thankful for that actually, even though it is very difficult work, <laughs> you know, it does make it a lot easier when you have um, modern day farming equipment. And so now we do have help to help us um, make a lot, a lot of that work less, but, um, there's a lot of value in that work you know just that getting your hands in the dirt and and getting your bare feet in the ground and and kind of being exhausted at the end of your day because you you gave all you had to that garden so that's one of the things um I'm really thankful for and I'm really thankful that my own leadership from my community the chief's council and the clan mothers they support our faith keepers they support our work that we do and, you know, all of our foods from the gardens are always, you know, we always have what we need for our ceremony. So that's really another, um, another good thing that's come out of the farm project. So right currently we do about 13 acres and we do that all by hand. And anywhere from maybe five to 10 people will manage those 13 acres. And during this pandemic, um, I did a little food research. I'm always doing research on nutrition and um, I'm real concerned about diabetes and the, some of the illnesses that our people are suffering from right now. So I want to think, how can we create more nutrients per acre instead of yield? And so what we're trying to do is see what, what foods we planted, a, what I, we called it a COVID garden last year. And we planted foods that help your own immune system um, fight viruses. And people really liked it because we cooked a lot of it for our elders meals. And we did a lot of um, sampling, things we never cooked before. And I'm gonna do some more research to see if there's anything else I can add to it this year. We started using medicines mixed in with our, um, our soups and our broths you know, to increase the nutrient. So we're really focusing on nutrients because our ancestors knew all of these things that were good for our bodies. And um, we're trying to reteach people the process of eating seasonally because, you know, we, we've gotten used to this um, uh, more of a, a colonized type of diet where we're, we're eating uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And Haudenosaunee people had what they called a standing pot. So we always had food available, you know, at all times of the day. And you only ate enough to keep you going to finish whatever task you were involved with at that time. And also you ate the foods that were in season. So you would follow the forest. You would follow the, um, the trees. You know, you would follow the gardens. You would follow the animals, you know, things that were uh, the fish, all of those different things. So we're trying to re-educate our young people on reconnecting with all of that food and eating in that process. Because if we can do that, 
the earth is providing everything that we still need for that. So some of the things, you know, that we started out initially just planting our three sisters and it grew from there because nutrition is so important component to all people. And we've all uh, grown away from eating nutritional food. I think there's, we're all guilty of it at some point. And so even if it's not realistic that we can eat a traditional food diet for three meals a day or, or however we may want to do that, then we could at least maybe do it a few times a week and start to make that a part of your routine, you know, for your family and getting the kids involved. So um, that led us to actually learning how, how did we prepare food before there was propane and things like that? Um, we're trying to reteach the skills to the young people. Can you start a fire without those things, without a match, without, um, you know, propane and lighter starters and all those things? Can we do those things? Can we learn that skill again so that we could really be more survivalists? And we also are teaching people how to use um, things from the forest for cooking, cooking purposes. So the food sovereignty doesn't just cover the growing in the gardens, it's the connection. It's the connection to the land. It's the connection that leads you from the garden to the forest. It leads you from the forest to the creeks, to the woods and back again to the fires where you're gonna prepare those foods. And the most important thing of all is the seed keeping, is learning how to care for the seeds so that when we all leave here, the seeds are left behind for the next seven generations. So one of the things um, that the farm led us to was a lot of cooking endeavors that we did, um, you know, as, as a group, as an organization, we traveled to many different indigenous food summits where we learned and picked up and sometimes even relearned um, knowledge from other people who are still having the same belief and sharing their methods of, of food preparation, cooking with hot rocks, um, you know, boiling water with no pan, using wooden troughs that you can carve out of, you know, wood and trees that are fallen, those kind of things. And to me, that's really been something that I see the youth gets more engaged in. So a lot of times if you do, uh, for example, Zoom presentations or PowerPoints, a lot of kids will, you know, some of our younger people, they tune out after so long. And so if we can do more hands-on activities, that's where the success is, um, is really gonna be because the mentorship programs, having an apprentice under you, even if it's not all the time, but you can include them in the process. Um, that's really, really important. So um, when we first started the farm, after we traveled to all these different uh, indigenous food summits, you know, we, uh, we would bring our own food. <laughs> and a lot of times the people that were preparing the, the conferences would call me and say, okay, well, you didn't send me a food order. So I need to know exactly what you need that you guys are gonna be preparing. And I would say, well, I thought it was a food sovereignty summit. We don't need to order anything. We're gonna bring all our own stuff. And every time the Onondaga Nation farm crew showed up, we were the only ones that brought all our own food. And it kind of uh, enlightened people. They're like, didn't you order any berries? I was like, no, we picked ours and we froze them last year. So we brought our own everything. And people were kind of like, I don't wanna do that, you know? And well, you can, let's show you how. So that's what it was all about. Let's uh, knowledge sharing and encouragement as well. So some of the things that we did um, for the Onondaga Nation is we traveled with the, um, the two-row wampum. We had um, a canoe journey where our community started here in Onondaga and traveled all the way through Manhattan, through, um, they came up in their canoes and that was really amazing. And we cooked for them all along the rivers and the creeks that they, um, they traveled at. And the group kept getting larger and larger until it, it finally uh, resulted in, in the end journey, which was paddling into the, uh, the bay there in, in Manhattan. And it was really, really um, emotional because it had been hundreds of years since our people had done that. And just to see all of our people dressed in their regalia, paddling their canoes, and then we marched from there to the United Nations. It was really, um, really an honor for us to be a part of it when it came to food as well. So um, there's a lot of events that 
you know, for us as, as an organization, but not just that, but as a community and the stories that we can share, there's so many things that we can tell people, you know, that even if you weren't there, you can like feel the energy of how, how powerful that actual event was. So, you know, that was one of the uh, major events that we cooked for. And we also um, cook for the recitals for our, the great law of peace. We've introduced a lot of um, traditional foods where we're gonna only eat that while the, the great law is actually being recited. And so we try to match the foods up with the stories that are being told. And, and that's a really uh, intense experience because we meet so many wonderful people from all over our uh, Haudenosaunee Confederacy in the kitchens. And then we create these lifelong relationships. Um, we've also participated in feeding visitors. So for example, we, um, we sponsored and, and hosted the World Lacrosse Games in 2015. And we had thousands of visitors here on this little nation and we managed to feed them every day. And when they had to come back with the lacrosse uh, organization to kind of uh, evaluate how the event went and you know what could be improved, and they kind of came back and made this report. They were like, the food, oh my goodness. People just kept talking about the food. You know, we fed them bison and everything we had here, fish and, and all the different Six Nations donated food and everyone in the communities even hosted families. You know, families in our community did that on their own and fed the visitors. And that was really amazing um, to see that experience. So cooking is a big part of the food sovereignty and sharing that love and the energy and that positivity. It goes a long way, you know, by sharing the food through meals. And that's actually part of the, the food is our medicine thought process. It's not just medicine for the people who are preparing it, but it's also medicine for the people who are receiving it. And the farm, uh, it just kind of grew, you know, along with these cooking events. We always had done cooking events within our own little community, but we also expanded that. And so um, it's, it's like reignited a whole um, force of people that are sharing recipes now and we're using forage, wild foods and mixing that in. And those are all the nutrition things we were talking about in the food sovereignty uh, circle that we need to reintroduce. So foraging is a big part of it. And that connection to recognizing plants and learning their names, and then maybe we don't know the names in Onondaga, so we can speak to some of the people in our language programs who tell us what they are. So now we can call them the proper names when we see them in the forest or in the fields. And that's been really, um, we've grown a lot in the foraging area. So after we started the farm, um, we had such wonderful harvest. I mean, we're so blessed and we're so thankful. I truly believe because of our ceremonies, our foods keep living on and that's what we were always told. And throughout my networks of people that I met, I ended up becoming friends with a woman who was um, from Oneida, Wisconsin. And at the time I was looking for some wild rice and she was looking for some white corn. And I said, well, we like to feed our nations. So maybe we could trade an equal amount for the wild rice for the white corn. Yeah, that would be great, she said. Um, her name is Leah Zaisi and uh, she's my good friend and collaborator on Braiding the Sacred. But that was the, our first um, connection was food. So we brought the corn there and we traded and she gave us the wild rice and we, we traded those two foods. And from that point on, she grew that corn out in uh, Wisconsin Oneida with a group of families that she belonged to like a growing co-op and it just took off. So from there, um, we started talking about, we need to get more corn growers. We need to get some people together to start sharing some knowledge and learning from and, and share, keeping the stories, the oral traditions alive and learning from all these different um, bio regions where people live now or Haudenosaunee people are all over the place. And, you know, we have different climates and temperatures depending on where we live. So these, this was important information we wanted to share. And there were, I believe six, there were six of us in the beginning that started the organization. So we, um, we were trying to think of a name of the group. What can we call the group? And we decided to call it Braiding the Sacred because we wanted all of our indigenous people to 
return to the sacred nature of food and the connection to it and to your community and to your seeds and your people and your leaders and your ceremony people and all of the things that you need necessary in order to have a successful community and garden. So um, it just started out as we were gonna have these small personal gatherings with indigenous people and growers. And we would have these talking circles based around corn. And we would just start to focus with the one thing at first, the corn. And we had about a hundred people at our first gathering. We, ha we had it here in the Onondaga Nation. And as a matter of fact, we had it at the Scanu Great Law Peace Center. So that was a really, um, you know, wonderful event. And then since then, which was 2016, I think, um, we have thousands of people involved now. It just sort of took off and it developed um, quite a following. And I mean, I've met some unforgettable people through this. It's created some wonderful nation to nation relationships and it's brought back all of the seeds. So I feel like, um, seeds that were even lost to us as Haudenosaunee people. We knew they existed, but some of us had never seen them. Some of us had never grown them. They were returned back to us. And um, through that organization, Braiding the Sacred, we decided we didn't just wanna have these conferences where people come and you get real jazzed up about things and everybody's real passionate and gung-ho and then everybody leaves and goes home and then you kind of slip back into your old routines. We wanted to create a lasting impact. And so we decided let's plant gardens when we have these gatherings instead, because we could still work and talk and that's what we do. And if we can't plant, then let's go back and have the gatherings at harvest time. So we could be helping a nation harvest their stuff and have the gatherings at that time. So we decided those were the two times of year that we would have the gatherings. We haven't had any this year because of COVID, but. Braiding the Sacred um, led us to meet a, a corn grower from Oklahoma, and he was Cheyenne. He was in, at the time, he, was, he had um, ownership of a seed collection that had belonged uh, to Carl Barnes, and he was a Cherokee corn farmer. He was from um, Oklahoma as well, and he just spent his whole life caring for these seeds. And he claimed that he could speak uh, the language of the corn. And I believe it because um, in some of his jars of seeds, he would get this message from the corn and he would jot it down on these little pieces of paper and fold them up almost like um, fortunes. And, you know, and when you get Chinese food and you break open your fortunes, it's kind of like that. And then sometimes we'd be going through the seeds and, and cleaning them up and putting them in a new container. And I'd find these little notes and there would be these really profound messages in there. So I believe what he says when he says he spoke the language of the corn and, and he was able to relay some of its messages. So when he passed away, he had thousands and thousands of varieties. Uh, his family, they didn't know what to do with it because um, they really weren't corn growers. They had chosen different paths in lives, in their lives. So. Uh, this man that was Cheyenne was kind of his apprentice. He was, um, they were very well spiritually connected and, and Carl trusted him with a lot of his knowledge and they shared a lot spiritually. And so his family said, um, we really want you to have dad's collection of seeds. That's what he would have wanted. And so they gave them to um, this man, his name is Al Toops. And Al Toops didn't realize like, all of that energy that's going to come off of those seeds and uh, what work it was. He didn't realize how hard this elderly man had worked to keep all those varieties alive. So he met Braiding the Sacred and he was like, finally, I found the group that I think uh, might be able to handle this. And, you know, long story short, he ended up inviting us there. And I thought we were just there to pick up a few Haudenosaunee varieties. He ended up giving us the entire collection and asked us to, um, you know, house that on the Onondaga Nation. And I called back home and I talked to some of the faith keepers, like these seeds are coming home. I can't believe it. And there's so many things in there that we thought were lost, you know, forever. 
And what we didn't know at the time is there was another half to that collection. <laughs> we thought that was it. And it took me three years with a lot of hands and help, a lot of women, college students, youth group, many, many people helped to um, get that, that seed collection organized, cleaned up. We actually took every single seed out of every single jar. We held them in our hands. We wiped them off with nice white cloths. We, we kind of cleaned them all up and put them in new containers and organized them all because he had them in, in all different kinds of coffee cans and things like that. And it took us a long time but now recently we found out there was another half to that collection and that has been returned to us. So every time I think I'm finished with the seeds, more come. So we still will have probably another couple of years of organizing this next bunch. But currently we're over, you know, 1200 varieties that we've already finished of corn. There's probably another 2000 more that we're gonna have to get through. So it is a lot of work, but um, some people call it seed keeping. Some people call it seed saving. And um, I've said this on a few different um, panels that I've been on, but I, I call it seed carrying because we carry those seeds for the next generations. We don't keep them or own them. They don't belong to us. They're a part of our community and they are meant to be passed on down through the generations. So we kind of more, um, we kind of think of it as we're just these vessels of the people are the vessels to carry them through to the next generation and further than that. And someone thought of us that way. So uh, we continue to work with Al Toops. He's part of our Braiding the Sacred Network. And um, that, that collection never ceases to amaze me. It's brought a lot of Haudenosaunee varieties back to us that we thought were gone. And now they're growing all over all six nations. So I'm very uh, thankful that we started up that organization and I'm thankful we've hosted gatherings in the Northeast, the Southern Plains, the Midwest, um, the Upper Midwest, and also the Southwest. We've had many gatherings down in the Pueblo areas, the Navajo Nation. Um, we've been invited to a lot of places. And whenever we have these gatherings, we think it's more uh, very important to have um, not just the corn growers involved anymore, but also to bring people from your language immersion programs so that they can help us, um, you know, learn the proper ways to say things and call them and even teach community members. We also invite elders who might know the stories, you know, but maybe they're not planting anymore. And we also have cooks, people who now are prepare a lot of these old foods, right? What are they used for? And we also have ceremonial people there to do the proper prayers and things like that. So that way you're including um, many different important aspects of your community. And then always inviting young people so that they're there to hear from the elders, you know, and that knowledge isn't gonna get lost. That's the key component to keeping all these traditions alive. Um, the farm project has um, every, I always say every time we build a shelf, it's like field of dreams. If we build it, they will come. So <laughs> every time we put a shelf up, we're always real careful. Cause we're like more seeds will show up. <laughs> we're running out of room, but then we find growers, you know? So we have about a hundred people right now that are helping us grow the collection out. Um, you know, that are ex very experienced corn growers that know how to keep it protected and it's you know open pollinated so we have to make sure they don't get um, mixed with anything that's genetically modified and stuff like that keep them heirloom so that's one of the more um, for me really uh, rewarding parts of the job is, is working with the seeds and everybody finds their um, their niche you know the thing they like the best and for me that's one of them one of the other things I uh, I really like is um, beekeeping I love my relationships to the bees. I like to sing to them. They know my scent and my face. So when I go to the hives, you know, I don't even have to wear a bee suit. They know me. And when I gently lift off the top, they'll, they'll they all crawl to the top and they look at you, you know, and you can actually see their faces and they're like babies. So it's really exciting when I get to open those hives. I love the smell, you know, of the honey and the bees and you can feel the heat coming off the hives. And uh, last year, I think it was, no, two years ago, because we didn't 
travel last year, but two years ago, um, I was in one of our other communities and, and an elder from uh, Wisconsin Oneida was, you know, sitting, I said, I'm going to go sit with him for lunch. I want to see what he's been up to. And I was telling him how much I love my bees and doing beekeeping. And he said to me, you know, if you can really, really get to understand your bees and you be patient and you pay attention, everything you need to learn about the great law of peace is there, right there inside of that hive. And I started to um, really pay attention to those bees and how each one had a responsibility and a duty to make the success of the hive and how um, that female energy of the, the queen was such an important component to keeping that hive going. And, and I think about that, about the female energy in our communities and just on earth in general. There's so much that I learned after he said that to me that it, um, it really opened my eyes to like thinking, expanding my thinking about some of the activities that I participate in and kind of looking at them from more of a, um, like a Haudenosaunee state of mind, but also having a spiritual connection to all of these um, activities. I see there's quite a few, um, a few questions here. So I thought maybe I'll answer some of them. Let me look in the chat here. Okay, so um, all right. Okay, so I can talk maybe about some of the seeds. All right, so the seeds in the collection there are varieties. He had a variety in there that is 4,000 years old. Um, it was gifted to him from um, an archaeologist who found the corn in a cave in New Mexico. And it was called uh, Anasazi blue corn. They don't really know what it was called because the Anasazi people, um, you know, they, they're they're not there anymore, but the seeds were alive. They weren't there to say what the name was. So that's just what they called it. But Carl grew those seeds from the original one that was 4,000 years old. And last year I planted a corn that was 140 years old, the seeds were. So I believe that they never lose their life. You know, um, there's uh, fossilized corn cobs in the collection. You know, there's different things that were thousands of years old. And he believed in the seeds, you know, he put the seeds through their ceremonies and he believed in it and he planted it and it grew. So I also planted um, a variety of beans that was 1400 years old. I never thought they would grow. I really didn't, to be honest. And they did. So I started out with um, eight beans and now I have 78 beans from that initial eight or seven. And um, yeah, that was really interesting. I was surprised about that. So let me see what some of the other questions might have been. Where did the coronation begin? I was born. So, okay. All right, so um, when I said that the strawberries was the leader of our plants, um, I'm not sure how familiar some of the people on the call may be, but um, when we give our, do our Thanksgiving address, uh, when they talk about the trees, the leader of the trees, which is the maple to us, you know, the first one that runs the, the sap, those are the, the leaders of all of the other plants. So they're kind of the leader to their community. And for us, the wild strawberries is that first plant that comes up and that's the leader. It's the first one that's going to bear fruit, you know, um, edible fruit. And so that's when we start our, our Thanksgiving uh, after our planting, that's the first food that comes up. So the strawberries is very revered to us as Haudenosaunee people. And it's something, it's medicine. It's considered medicine to us. It's a big part of all of our, um, you know, our teachings that we, we give thanks for that. We have a whole ceremony based around that. And so that's why um, obviously the strawberries are, are ready even before the corn bears fruit. So, um, you know, each one of our, uh, ceremonies that takes place is based on the moon and the food that's in season and the strawberries is that first one. So let me see what else here. Okay, and then um, somebody was asking how, uh, how did the coronation begin? And for Haudenosaunee people, we go back to our uh, creation story and how the corn grew from the body of uh, Sky Woman's daughter when it grew from the breast and 
corn actually produces a milk and it's our life sustaining food. So that was one of the, uh, one of our creation stories. So that's where our corn began. I can't say a time for sure because it's just always been that way. We don't have um, years or dates on things, but since the beginning of time for us, that's where it came from for us. Alrighty. Can you use more land for communal farm? We do have a lot of land that we can use. Um, you know, we rotate our fields so that we're never, um, you know, we're never using uh, too much of the nutrients and we're not depleting the soil. So what we do is use our three sisters planting method. Um, we do large quantities of planting. So we don't just do singular mound planting. Sometimes we'll do smaller gardens with that. But for the bigger fields, we will plant uh, corn first and then we'll plant the corn there three times so that we don't, because corn uh, draws a lot of nutrients out of the soil. And each year we also burn the fields. So that keeps um, bugs and it puts all that nutrients back into the soil. After that third time, we rotate it and we put beans in that field to replace all of the nitrogen into the soil. And after we grow the beans there, then we make the mounds and grow um, squash in that field. And after that, we let that field sit um, empty for a year. And so the, the gardens are always chasing one another. You know, even though we do the 13 acres, we have different fields there um, so that we can rotate those different varieties and also uh, to not deplete the soil so that we can put them in different places. So that's the way um, we do that. And beekeeping, yes. Um, one of the things that I did was instead of, um, I actually was able to split one of the hives. Um, so I took some of the honey. This is kind of like if you take honey out of the hive and you put it near the hive, the bees will actually take all the honey and put it back in there. So you can't um, actually steal the honey from them. <laughs> and so if I, I just kept doing that all, all summer, moving honey from one hive to the next. And eventually the bees create, you know, there were so many in this hive, they realized it was more comfortable over here. And some of them moved into that one and created a new queen. So um, when the new queen came out, that there's two hives now side by side. And now I was able to take that one and move it to another place. And I might try it again now with those two. Um, I let them succeed for a couple of years first. We haven't, I mean, I've been lucky. We haven't had any um, trouble with um, any of the mites or anything like that. But um, most of the hives that we have down on the Onondaga Nation we don't use pesticides in our community. And so that's why a lot of our bees will succeed. Um, we have a lot of gardens. You know, our community had 89 gardens last year. For a small community, that's a lot. And that's a lot of food. So it's good to see everybody getting back to that. Um, we don't just have uh, the nation farm. You know, we have our community members that are growing their own food in their own yards with their own gardens. And that's really um, important to have um, families, you know, getting back in the garden again. So to me, that's uh, very, very like promising. And then uh, we also did a project, uh, the Six Nations Agricultural Society. We did a project in 2019 where we all got together and we created, I drove dirt down in my truck and another community member brought some um, uh, compost that he had in his garden. And then we had another community member go get some pails and another community member drill holes in the pails. And we created these mobile gardens in the pails that people could um, take with them. And if they only wanted to grow a couple of things, they could move it in and out of the sun and rain or for, you know, they could protect it or, or move it around where it needed to be. And that was really um, successful because not everybody wants to tend or has the time to tend a great big garden, but we wanted them all to be included. So for anybody on the call, that's a great way to get young people. Um, you know, we, before the pandemic, we had a plan that we were going to use more pails and have the um, kids at the nation school paint those pails and put some designs on them and kind of decorate the pails up and so that we could gift them to elders who, you know, so they don't have to bend over so far to plant. And we weren't able to do that, um, but we're maybe next year we're gonna do it, we're gonna try. So pale gardening is another way of keeping, you know, agriculture alive and not, um, 
you know, having it be a struggle where it's going to turn somebody away from growing food. So you still could do corn, beans, squash, tomatoes, potatoes, you could do anything. Um, you know, people did sage plants, they did all different stuff. And then we had a, um, a giant seed table where people could go and, and uh, pick whatever it is that they wanted to grow in those pails or even take to their uh, personal gardens at home. Okay, so one of the main things we do with the seed keeping is that we make sure um, everybody keeps a good mind. And so that's really important whenever you're working with food because it's healthy to have relationships with your fellow gardeners that are around you in the garden, that you're bringing that energy there. Um, also when you're harvesting, when you're cooking, you know, a lot of times if you um, hear people in a kitchen, you hear them laughing a lot, you know, because they're joking around it. And that is good energy. It's good to put that into the food that you're going to be sharing with people. So, you know, your intention and your energy that you're bringing to those activities should really be something that's, um, you know, the best you have to offer. And if you're not really feeling the best, then sometimes there's other things you can do that maybe you shouldn't be in the garden and we could give you a different task. But when it comes to the seed keeping, it's really, uh, you know, when we're tending to them, it can be very emotional. Sometimes you'll have these thoughts that enter your mind and you don't know where they come from. And I feel like it could have been in maybe the people that touched the seeds before you or the ancestors before that. And you could keep going back generation after generation sometimes knowledge even enters your mind. And uh, that's one of the rewarding parts about working with the seeds. There are, um, if anybody, yeah, is ever interested in uh, getting involved in helping out with the seeds, you know, um, due to COVID restrictions, you know, today was our first time we've had visitors there in quite a while, um, but, if you ever want to, you know, you're always welcome to, um, you know, set something up and we can see if we can accommodate that. We haven't really been working um, on the seed collection because we've been so focused on doing um, the gardens and putting food away for our nation, but we're going to get back to that in 2021. You know, I thought a lot about uh, this Erie Canal Museum and how did it impact us as Haudenosaunee people? and our waterways and our travel ways. And I was able to find out that uh, Route 20, Route 5 and 20, a long time ago was actually called the Forbidden Trail. And it was an Iroquois path that ran all across New York State. And only people were only allowed to travel on it if the Haudenosaunee people gave them permission. And so it was really interesting because it runs all the way to Ohio, almost to the, you know, it runs across the country. So we started, instead of jumping on the throughway, let's travel on that road, you know? And, and it was funny how the places that it led us to, which were a lot of our, um, our old uh, agricultural areas, a lot of our old fishing grounds, a lot of our old um, like village points where they were located previously. And we found trail trees all along that way, you know, showing you go this way, go that way. There's water this way. You could read the language of the trees. And so that really made me start thinking, you know, when I, I look around and I see all these farms and gardens, like a lot of that was, um, you know, our, our ancestral places that we planted. And so we look to see these different elevations and levels and where was the medicine gathering grounds. And you can learn a lot if you, you know, you pay attention to the surroundings. But a lot of us are drawn to travel on Route 5 and 20 whenever you want to have like a nice relaxing day, a Sunday drive or something. And a lot of that falls along the Erie Canal pathway, right? That runs across New York State. And it's funny because that was our forbidden trail. And, you know, they even created the throughway, the New York State throughway to follow that same path, you know, because it went through all of our villages, even to this day, you know, you could travel from here to Oneida, uh, to Ganajohalege, Mohawk territory, you could head west through Ganondagan, you know, and end up in um, the Seneca Nation. So it's really interesting to know, like, if you follow the foods and the planting and where they traveled, it's all along that forbidden trail. And the reason it was called that is because um, they also called it the Iron Path, 
because it was forbidden because you had to, you had to have permission to travel that even after there was um, contact with um, some of the you know the people that traveled here but also uh, even after there there was their own villages you know so we had our our vis our visitors from across the ocean and then there was our villages but there still was that reciprocity of traveling on the forbidden trail and it also was called um, the iron path. And the reason it was called that is because it was already like a paved road from so many of our people traveling it year after year and their footsteps, it, it kind of packed down the, um, the soil where it was easy to travel. And they were some of the um, early uh, Champlain and different people that had come through here were like fascinated by our roadway system. And it was all meant to get to gardens to help because we had a lot of ceremonial times where oh, these guys need help on weeds. So we're sending a gang down to help them. And these guys need help braiding corn. So we're going to this village and everybody would go village to village. So that was pretty interesting when I, uh, I came across that information. Okay, so what we learned about seed um, storage is mostly that um, we didn't really want to rely on refrigeration and freezing um, seeds. A lot of seed, you know, seed preservation is done using those kind of uh, facilities. We wanted to do it the same way that our ancestors did. And so a lot of the seed, um, the seed drying is really important, making sure that the um, moisture content of the seeds doesn't um, carry any humidity so that you don't have mold or funguses that'll form in there or you don't want to get moths and things like that so we tried to make sure that we do the proper drying process and also um, we've learned from different elders different ways when you're putting them into jars for saving there are certain things you can put into the seeds um, some people even use wood ashes some people use bay leaves um, some people, I, I always say they sing. So like I'll take seeds and I can put them next to my ear and I can actually hear when they're dry enough to put away. And now some of the younger people are learning it because you can hear it if there's still moisture in there. It makes a different sound. So it sounds crazy. I used to think people thought I was crazy because I'd say I can hear it's not ready. But I met a man recently who can do the same thing with beans. And I was asking him, what do you think of our beans? He goes, no, they're not dry enough. And he did the same exact thing I did. And he's from uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. And it was funny. I said, I thought I was the only person that did that. <laughs> and then I met somebody else that does it too. So I know that must be something um, our ancestors did. And we just kind of rely on, um, we don't have a lot of clay pots like we used to. So now we use um, glass mason jars, just a modernized version. But um, there are people that are bringing back the clay pots, cooking in the clay pots and using them for seed storage. And it's something that we want to, um, you know, kind of bring back into our, uh, our program as well, because we did learn a few uh, classes of how to make the clay pots. And so that was really important. Um, before the pandemic started, we traveled with Braiding the Sacred to a community called Akama. And the community, I don't know if anyone who was here knows where I'm talking about, but the place is called Sky City. So it is on the highest mesa um, in the Southwest over there. And, you know, some people actually get altitude sickness. Some of our people that traveled with us got altitude sickness from being up so high. But um, they had invited us there to have a Braiding the Sacred gathering. And a big part of our food sovereignty program isn't just growing the corn, the beans, the squash, and the traditional foods. It's also hunting and fishing. And so we have men, you know, that, that go out all week long, hunt, fish, uh, they fillet, they butcher, they clean it all up, they package it up. And that's also distributed to our community. So when we were out there visiting with the corn, um, they allowed us, it's like a forbidden community. They don't really allow outsiders in even other indigenous people and so we had to go through months and months of this like interview process from their leadership there to say you know well what are you going to do while you're here and how is it going to benefit our people and who are you and where do you come from and all this stuff so they finally gave us an invite and we went there and they were very impressed with 
like the fact that we were there to actually do something to plant. And so when we went out there the first time, I said, geez, I thought the people in, in the Southwest planted everywhere, you know, and I only saw a few cornfields. And they plant, they have these field chiefs that plant in a place that's a very sacred place for them. And even community members are not allowed in the garden. And so they were struggling because the elk were coming in and eating all their corn, the crows were coming in. So they allowed us into this sacred garden. No one could believe it, even their own community members. So we went there and they were asking for us, you know, what could be some solutions to this problem? And I said, well, you know, um, our people were told to plant food for the animals. And so maybe that's what you guys need to do. So that's what they did. They, um, they plant, we said, instead of planting for the people, let's plant a garden for the animals. And then you guys can come back and plant for the people later. And lo and behold, it worked because it kept the elk out of their garden. They ate all the 50 rows of corn that we planted outside and they didn't go inside their garden. So um, they invited us back for a, um, a food trade, you know, so we took five buffalo from our community and we drove it all the way down um, to, you know, that was already butchered. The meat was already butchered and packaged up to distribute to their community. And then they allowed our hunters to go get five elk. And then we would butcher that, and bring it back to our community. So it was good to see that through the corn, which originally we were there to braid corn and help them with their corn, um, you know, their corn problem where the elk was eating the corn, we had another solution. I said, and I have another solution for you. We could, we could uh, take some of those elk off your hands. <laughs> and so they invited us back and it was good to hear from them recently because they want to do it again. And, you know, these opening these food uh, tradeways like that created this wonderful relationship with a whole secret, you know, area where now they're a little more open, you know, a little more open to having us as visitors and, and other, now there's, there was like, I think he said 70 something gardens there this year. And it went from like 10 to 70 something. So he was thankful that we, um, you know, their community was very thankful and their leader that I had spoken to was thankful that the gardens um, came back. So it, it only takes, you know, just a small group of people, even organic farmers, you know, even indigenous farmers, any farmers at all, even inner city farmers, a small group of dedicated people can, can really feed a whole community. And that's what the information I think that a lot of us do need to share. That's what food sovereignty is, feeding your own community. And so if anybody ever needs help or has any questions or advice or anything, you know, maybe not on this, this uh, presentation, but at another time, I definitely would be willing to help out or offer any information that I may have to share or that I could be helpful for. Um, my, my workers that I work with communally here, we're all like a family. And that's really important because Sometimes, you know, like the younger kids will go off and they live their lives, but they may have worked there for a couple of years. Now they can feed their family. And that's the goal of the, of the actual farm is to teach people a skill for a lifetime. You know, it might not be a career, but they might learn what they need to know. And then they, they carry that with them for the rest of their lives. And that's one of the most important parts of the work. You know, today um, we had an activity with the Interfaith Works. They brought a chicken coop up and it was a really amazing experience to meet all these leaders of faith from the local area here in our central New York area. And everybody collaborating with this good mind. We talk about a lot of this good mind, you know, got Nico Hio, we talk about in our Haudenosaunee culture. And today I really got to witness that got Nigo Hill all the way around. You know, um, everyone worked together. We shared stories, we shared food. We have this wonderful gift with these amazing little baby chicks. You know, now we have a place for our children in the community to come up to, to connect with these, um, you know, these little baby chicks and watch them grow and um, care for them. And, you know, it's like, to me, projects like that are very important in all the communities. Um, you know, sharing these, the storytelling and sharing um, what's possible. Because some people will say, there's no way you have these thousands of varieties. And then they come to the farm and they're like, wow, 
I never thought that really existed, you know, so there's so much um, that we can learn from one another, not just me, but there's many elders that I've learned from. I still, I spent the whole pandemic calling them just to check on them, to see how they were doing and to get their advice on how to, what should we be focusing on now, you know, and, and they, you know, one of them told me, plant as many beans as you can, because we might not be able to rely on animal proteins and we might have to go vegan for a while. And I was a vegetarian for almost 18 years. And I said, oh, I, I don't mind eating that diet. I could easily do that. So we grew tons of beans this year on the advice of the elders and we didn't just focus on corn. So listening to the elders in your communities is so important and making sure that the youth gets to hear that. If they weren't there, share what you learned with them. I find that's really um, successful in, you know, sometimes we don't sit with the grandmas like we used to and we don't have the time, everyone's so busy, but part of what the farm is about and part of what Braiding the Sacred is about is the same thing. It's bridging that gap between all the knowledge of our elders and making sure that the younger generation can keep that going. Um, I don't want to over talk. So let me see if there's any more questions. Okay. Natural mess that, oh yes, I do. Squash bugs. Yes. So, um, you know, we learned a lot of, we're doing organic farming. So it's truly organic and non-GMO. So every food that we have is not genetically modified and the, we don't put any pesticides or any fertilizer besides uh, natural fish, fish things and burning and the methods that I already mentioned. When the hunt, when the fishing guys, uh, we have the rest garden, we let them throw those spoils in there from the fish that they catch. And um, that puts a lot of nutrients back in there. So we use those methods, but I have the same problem with squash bugs where I, um, I was like, oh, they take half of everything we grow. So last year we planted 5,000 squash plants thinking, well, we might get 2,500. Well, I found an organic method for squash pest control and it was milk. So if you have milk that's expired or about to expire, um, we had some milk donated to the nation and it was right on the border. And, you know, we thought, well, what are we going to do with it? And I Googled, what can I do with milk? And I found it on the internet from one of the um, Amish farmers that they use milk to kill the squash bugs. And it also prevents blight on tomatoes. So we took the milk and we poured it on the mounds, you know, to, um, before we planted the squash, we put it, we let it soak in there. And apparently, something in the lactic acid in the milk prevents the larvae from the squash bugs being able to um, multiply so fast. So we did have a few, but not like usual. So I would recommend trying it because it worked. And we had no blight at all on our, our tomato plants and they grew to be, some of them were taller than me and I'm five foot seven. And I was like, I never seen a tomato plant this big before. <laughs> so um, the milk for some reason, it worked. And the other thing we tried was uh, diatomaceous earth in a sock, sprinkling some of that, you know, just putting it in a sock and just shaking it once or twice. We did that. And we also used wood ashes. So we put the wood ashes from our, um, that we used to, uh, you know, make hominy with our corn to take the hulls off. We call it washing corn. We put those in a sock and we just kind of, you know, tapped a little bit of that into the gardens. And there you go problem was solved. Some people say to use soap, but um, I don't like to put soap in the garden, but I, they say it works. I just haven't tried it myself. And about the efforts to provide food. Okay. And preparing meals for elders. Okay. So um, we also um, work with an organization uh, that's called SOFSA, and it's here in the um, Tri-County area, the Syracuse Onondaga Food Systems Alliance. It's a wonderful organization of basically anybody who has anything to do with food, restaurants, nutritionists, growers, distributors, um, professors that teach food studies. Um, we have hunting men, fishing men, you know, people who are involved with um, anything in the forest, so there's so many aspects of food, you know, um, 
and also inner city, urban gardens. I mean, anything you could name that has to do with food. And they're always looking for people who are interested to become a part of the group. It's That's another group that's just blown up. And that group was very um, important to us during this pandemic because we already had the relationships and the friendships made and the um, distribution channels of conversation and how we could get food to places. That's the organization that, you know, we could do things in a snap. So I think that we're actually going to have that organization be a role model for a lot of more uh, cities and tri-county areas. You know, usually that's how people work is like a tri-county. And um, I'm so thankful that we were a part of that organization because every time someone said, ah, I don't want to throw out all this milk. What do I do? We'll take it. You know, we'll find a way. And we all work together to make sure that food didn't go to waste. You know, um, even if it was used as compost in the gardens, that's still not a waste. Um, so if anybody is ever interested to see about some of the work that they do, I feel it's a really important organization to become a part of. And um, one of our hunting and, and fishing guys um, is a big part of the organization and he attends all the meetings and um, he has a seat on the board there. And his name is Curtis Waterman. I see he's on the call. Hi, Curtis. Um, if you ever have any questions about that, you could always ask Curtis. I am usually quite busy. I try to make as many of those as I can when I'm needed. And um, Curtis always keeps me in the loop on what's happening. So I'm, I'm real thankful for that group because they helped us um, with these connections in food. And then we were also to help, able to help them where we knew there was need and maybe not even in our own community, but outside working with some of our allies we were able to share quite a bit of food and instead of letting it, um, keeping it local as well, trying to keep it organic, trying to keep it healthy, trying to keep, um, you know, just keep everybody going basically. So if anybody's ever interested to be a part of that organization, I would, I would highly recommend that. Um, okay. And yes, I do. Um, I do. A lot of um, workshops and you know outdoor presentations. I think it's important to have a lot of hands-on activities. Um, a lot of it, for me to tell you about the things we do isn't the same as if we're all in a group together, like like we did today. You know, when you're with the group live and in person, and people are are collaborating to create things, there's much more. Um, you know, there's much more knowledge that you're really gonna absorb. And, you know, my relationship to the foods and the people that I work with, it's, it goes so much deeper than a presentation could ever um, really relay than when I'm, you know, speaking about those things in person and actually showing people. And sometimes there's really um, like things that are planned that will happen at some of the workshops. You know, we also do workshops on um, learning how to uh, tan the hides. So we're not making any waste from all of the animals that we've, um, you know, the hunters have got have gathered. We save the hides and, and make leather. We do tool making out of the bones. Um, some of the men do artwork on, on different parts of that with the deer antlers and things. So we try to be as resourceful as we can the way we were taught. And I think that's important. So a lot of times you have to have workshops to show people that's, you know, that's very relevant. Okay, so we got that and Angie, right. there were a couple of questions, both from non-Indigenous and Ongwe Homewe people about how they could um, contribute to these sorts of efforts. Um, well, today like was a good example where um, Interfaith Works, they um, have a project annually the way they explained it to me was that, um, you know, they all like want to invest in something that's um, going to benefit a whole community. It's not just for an individual. And so like they had the idea that they could do this chicken coop so that we would have eggs for the community. And I thought that's perfect, you know? So we, we collaborated like that. And through SOFSA, um, we're able to collaborate with different organizations. And, and then I also, um, you know, bring that here to my uh, leadership and, and community members so they're aware of what's happening, you know, so everyone knows um, about these events and can participate. I think to try to be inclusive is really important and, um, you know, to always follow your uh, community protocols as well. 
I learn community protocols outside of my, you know, when I go to other places, I make sure I, I don't want to um, make any mistakes. So I'm always asking ahead of time, you know, can you um, let me know exactly what's expected from us? You know, so developing those friendships and relationships, I think are important to, um, you know, developing trust in order to, to create these um, collaborative efforts. So a lot of times I've, I've traveled to universities, um, you know, doing presentations where there's a lot of organic farmers out there that, you know, have information they can help share with us. And, you know, that's important to keep our foods alive and keep it going. So I think, um, you know, by developing friendships with people is like the key to getting something going and, you know, finding out where you can specifically help out. It, it kind of starts more on a personal level that's what I have, I found has, has been like the key to successful partnerships for myself, you know, at, at our nation farm. And, oh, I see another question popped up. Did I answer that question? Um, did that answer the question or was there something further? Yeah, that... I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Definitely. Um, that's I'm kind of sure. what SOFSA, yeah, that's what SOFSA is kind of about is that um, we have a relationship to, um, you know, to our neighbors called Gaswenta, which is a two row uh, wampum relationship where we both are traveling in our canoes and we live on this same land and we, a lot of us love it the same, you know, and we want to have a relationship with one another, but we don't know how. So how can we travel down those same, um, you know, down those same paths of life and respect one another's differences? That's really the key and very important. Yeah, I think um, one thing that I've really loved about what you've been saying is all the different ways that food has created a sense of community. So with other people on your nation, with other nations, with non-Indigenous people, um, all the different ways that food brings us together, which I think is really beautiful. And um, the other thing I wanted to mention is when you were talking about the bees. And um, that's another sort of community, right? And thinking about, you had mentioned specifically the roles and the responsibilities of the bees in, in making the community work. And that made me think about the Thanksgiving address, right? Yes. And our um, responsibility to express gratitude. And um, I think um, being more involved with growing your own food. I know that I had um, a pretty big garden during the COVID quarantine period. And that gave me a whole new appreciation for the tremendous amount of work that goes into um, maintaining the garden. And I had the question about the squash bugs because they became my nemesis um, during yeah. that time. And yeah, it just gave me such a strong sense of appreciation and gratitude for the food that I was growing. And so just the themes of, of community and of responsibility, it's a different way, right, of looking at the world. And um, yeah, and gratitude and food just is at the heart of all of that. So um, yeah, there's different ways to describe it when you say food sovereignty, food justice, um, food security, you know, uh, food sustainability, all of those things really at the at the heart of it have the same message, you know, which is um, that connection to the land, the reward of growing your own food and the spirituality part of it that comes along with it, it changes you. So when you meet other gardeners, it's almost like you instantly have this other bond, whether you're native or you're from the, here or there, that doesn't matter. Remember, everybody's indigenous to somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, that gives you that sense of gratitude because you know now you can relate to one another. You have that, that common thread, you know, and it's really important. That's yeah. right. Food, food is the unifier and it's going to be the thing that heals the world. You know, that's what um, I really believe because you see places that struggle when they don't have food, then the leadership, the people, the governing bodies, everything in that area where they're struggling with food is, you know, becomes compromised. 
Mm -hmm. And when you see a community that's successful with food and has, um, you know, they have abundance and they have that gratitude and the thank the thankful um, words to go along with all of those things that they have. Those are the communities that can can work together and and be successful. Yeah, I watched a uh, part of the video from the braiding the sacred uh, video or the website earlier today, and I especially keyed in on some words by Oren Lyons, and he talks about sovereignty. And we talk about that a lot here at the Scano Center. And a lot of times I'm thinking of it from the political sense and right. from nation to nation. And he's talking to another gentleman who shows him a handful of corn. And he says, yes. this is sovereignty. And that was really powerful. It really, that's the most fundamental level of yes. sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you feed yourself? You know, mm -hmm. if you can feed yourself, you are sovereign because now you have not given up the thing that keeps you alive, you haven't given that power to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's yeah. really um, a powerful thought. And I, I laughed because it was funny when he had the seeds in his hand. I was like, I have seeds in my pocket too. I always <laughs> have seeds in my purse. I have seeds in my pockets. Sometimes I have them on his jewelry. And I thought, oh, that is so, um, like, I totally can relate to that. <laughs> well, I really feel like we could talk for a long time. And I know that people have lots of questions I made. I have like two pages of topics I'd love to discuss with you. So I just want to let folks know that hopefully in the future, there will be other opportunities for us to have Angela back as a presenter or other folks from the Nation Farm. Um, I'm particularly interested in food preservation or recipes, yes. um, how to prepare traditional foods. So I'll just let folks um, in attendance know tonight that um, we are continuing to work and expand this series and we would love to hear more from Angela and the folks at the Onondaga Nation Farm. And we just thank you so much, Angie, for all the work that you're doing. And for thank you for having me. I, I love talking about this stuff. So sometimes if uh, anyone ever wants to visit, that's all I ever talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say that you really, are- I really do because I love it so much and uh, it's a big part of my life. It's a big part of my grandchildren's lives. And and when it comes from the heart, you know, it's it's something that's easy to talk about. Yeah. So I'm I'm thankful to have everybody here that, that wanted to listen. Wonderful. Yeah, well, well, the, your passion certainly comes through the screen. I think we can all feel that tonight. So thank you. Thank you so much, Noaha to you. And we'll look forward to speaking with you again, Angie. Okay, thank you. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you for joining you us. Too. Take care. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's great.